everyone. This is Brittany Bond, and welcome back to the podcast. Today, I have a very special guest. His mm. name is Josh. Josh, can you tell us your last name? Moncure. That's great. Mm. So, Josh Moncure, he is um, a very wonderful musician that I met on Copanyong. Did we meet last month or the month before? I can't remember. Uh, what is time? I don't, I'm not sure. What is time? Um, yeah. Are we talking linear or like <laughs> this spiritual? Dimension? Yeah, I don't this know. dimension, other timelines? We don't know. Um, so we are both synchronistically here in Chiang Mai and been having a lot of fun going around and seeing live music and playing and our adventures. Yeah. It's really, I love it. It's so much fun. And I'm also a big fan. <laughs> after this, what are we going to do? We're going to uh, wear hazmat suits and smash stuff with sledgehammers. Yeah, so yeah, that's happening. There's actually a place here in Chiang Mai mm -hmm. where you can pay them money and you can smash things. And when my girlfriend told me about it, I was like, I'm doing that. Yeah, it's super you. <laughs> <laughs> I need to get some anger out. Mm -hmm. um, don't and we all. Yeah, don't we all? <laughs> <laughs> and now there's a group of us going, so I'm really excited. We're going to do that after this. Mm. Um, so I thought it would be really nice to talk to you about, like you and I are always are talking about like emotional stuff and spiritual stuff, everything, Yeah, uh, honestly. Literally all the things. All yeah. the things. Uh, but to start off, I thought it would be really nice to talk about you as a masculine in the timeline, like in mm. today's world as a man. Mm. Did you feel that growing up you were allowed to share your emotions? Mm. Uh, I felt completely unable to share my emotions in a safe way as a child. I remember being a very sensitive child. Um, mm, and that's cute. Yeah, I was a sensitive little... I can see that. You know, now I just write love songs and stuff, so it makes sense. Um, <laughs> but yeah, very sensitive, and I really had a strong desire to express myself emotionally, even as a child. And I was, I was told that it wasn't okay, and that it made me less of a man. Less of a man, and also that even in, I think in my family, no one was, really, because uh, I come from a black family. and mm. So no one was sharing their emotions? Yeah, no one was allowed, even, uh, I mean, even the women in my family. Um, I think my mom is very, it, I came from a family that both of my parents grew up very poor, and then they became doctors, and they worked extremely hard. And uh, they both came from also very racist places, um, where and it was very difficult to be black. My mom from the South yeah. uh, in America, and my dad from a very racially tense place in like Oakland in California in the 60s and mm -hmm. 70s, like Black Panther era and stuff. There was a lot of racial tension. And so it was very much of, of like a kind of survival um, place where it wasn't safe to show your emotions and you had to kind of, you had to suppress them to be able to get ahead. And my parents were really, that, was, that worked really well for them. Like they were very successful in doing that. And so they were trying to teach their survival mechanisms to us which is, yeah, that's what you do as parents because you want your kids to be successful and survive. But yeah, I felt very... Yeah, how did that feel in your body? It felt stifling, felt not safe. And it's been a big process of reopening that part of myself. How were you able to create safety in your body to feel your emotions? It was actually a very long process because when I was younger... Um, uh, when my parents got divorced around age 16, I just hit this wall where I had so many emotions and I was so unable to express them that they just all became repressed and pushed into my body. And I was extremely anxious and depressed and stopped going to school and was just, yeah, just a mess, basically, mm -hmm. because that's what happens when we don't express our emotions. Hashtag sledgehammers. <laughs> but <laughs> it's one way. <laughs> yeah. It, I've uh, since been through a circuit of many mediums and modalities from therapy and group therapy and yoga and spirituality and all things just, I mean, it's really just a big process of coming back to myself and finding ways to 
see myself and hear myself and express myself in different ways. I remember you told me about the therapist that you had in high school. Oh, yes. I actually still have, I've had that therapist for 10 years. You still see him? Yeah, when I go back to America, yeah. That's um, so cute. I, d I currently don't see him, or when I'm somewhere else other than Asia. It's just because he, he works zone. from like, yeah, the exact times. That's like 2 a.m. to 7 a.m. or something, or 6 a.m. here, so I don't. I just remember you telling me that like, if anyone can hear, there's airplanes. We live under the airport in Chiang Mai. Mm. But um, I remember you telling me about this therapist that for you in that moment, he was kind of like a representation of the divine masculine in the sense that like he was just like emotionally grounded mm -hmm. in this mountain of energy, like just safe, grounded energy. And you could just go in there and just be emotionally chaotic and yes. he would just be like everything's fine so my therapist that i've had for the last 10 years and i was introduced to when i was uh, 16 or 17 he his philosophy to therapy was very much one in which he was not interested in fixing any of his patients and what he was interested in doing was no he's just really loud okay what he was interested in doing was showing us secure friendship and basically allowing people to come into his office and be and that could mean a lot of things because at this time I was very depressed very nihilistic and also um, and like to be honest very I was had a lot of experience with like debate and logic and rhetoric and I just been reading books voraciously my entire life so, so I was you were very good stuck at stuck in your I was head very <laughs> stuck in my head and very good at arguing <laughs> intellectually why, intellectually why yeah. we should be depressed <laughs> <What>? <laughs> and why my worldview was correct <laughs> and he would just look at me through all of these things through all of the the wild things i would say mm -hmm. and like he wouldn't try to fix me he would just accept me completely and yeah how did that make you feel in the moment it made me feel when I was first going there, it made me feel a bit upset because I wanted a reaction mm -hmm. because I was used to very chaotic relationships. And oh, I that's what you thought love yeah, was. Yeah. And so mm -hmm. there was al also almost this element of like, he doesn't care because he's not trying to fix me. And slowly it, he and then? ironed into my immune system or er, my nervous system that, yeah, that's actually what love was. <laughs> 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 Someone just calmly accepting you yeah. and creating emotionally safe space mm -hmm. over and over again, no matter what. Yeah. yeah. How so? How has that relationship affected you becoming the man that you are? Um, I realized that the goal that all of us have, or that at least that I have, that I learned from him, is that relationships are really about creating homes for within ourselves, for our, ourselves, and then for other people. And I see how that's what he was actually doing, that we want to be a stable container, a placeholder. We want to be able to hold people gently but firmly. And mm, that's yeah. beautiful. So he really modeled that for me. And that modeling took years. <laughs> 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 like it was not like a, he showed this to me and within months, I mean, I've been seeing him for 10 years. It was like. Well, it's an embodiment thing, right? Yeah, it was completely. Mm, it's it like a vibrational, emotional, in your body mm -hmm. thing. It's not like you took a course or something. And it wasn't until a couple of years ago where I reali realized like what he did. And I'm like, whoa. I was like, wow, you actually, wow. <laughs> oh, that's yeah. beautiful. When you told me about him, I was like, oh, that's why you are the way you are. Like mm -hmm. in, a, in a good way. Yeah. Because you and I have... Um, <coughs> gone through some stuff together mm -hmm. and I felt like you were always just so calm mm. and so like yeah creating a lot of emotional safety for me and mm. that has been such a beautiful <coughs> example of what a man can be in my life like someone I'm actually interacting with that's like reaffirming that yeah this is the kind of man I want to be around like this is the energy mm. I want to share my energy with men that support me in this way hold space for me in this way are grounded and have my best interests at heart, you know, mm -hmm. not like trying to emotionally manipulate things so that they can get what they want out of me. Wow. Thank you. That's, that really makes me feel seen and loved. 
I do see you. You know that. I know. I um, I think that it's also just a reflection of the way that I want to father myself. Mm. I realized that my inner parent and my inner father had a lot of. I mean, I, and this is no in no way to bash my own father because I love him dearly. But yeah, my inner fathering was was off, and it was at times very rigid and forceful and then at times just absent and i realized that what mm. i wanted to build was like this this wall or like i wanted to build like a being i don't know i really like combat sports so sometimes i use these metaphors but like someone who's in a ring and just catches the punch and then just like puts it down you know like this something that's very like firm and like a wall but just everything just bounces off and falls in front of it no, yeah, I think yeah. that's what it, the masculine is, though. Yeah, exactly. I mean, like, if it's if the energy is flowing, like, they can create this really beautiful, safe container for the feminine to just unfold more and more and mm -hmm. more into her power, which amplifies his power. But he just needs to hold a safe space. Yeah, it is completely. And also, like, no matter how s the stronger something is, the more it just duds. Mm -hmm. The stronger the impact is, the more. And so, yeah, I realized I, w I was just bouncing very much between something that you know, got hit and needed to, felt like it needed to hit back or something that just like felt like it couldn't take a hit at all and was just dodging all the punches. And yeah, I, yeah, I to would be in the ring, but, but not be out for blood. That's kind of what it feels like. I mean, that is, I think what a lot of men don't realize is that <clears throat> in order to be the divine masculine, we need them to face their own shadows and actually be really in your power. Like be mm. able, like, women talk about this like this is why classically women want to have the bad boy but it's not that it's that they want to know that your primal protective instincts are intact mm. and that you're willing to and able to protect them this is like a f visceral need that all women have um and if they don't feel that they might push in the relationship to try and make sure that they are that the man actually has that. And a lot of men think, oh, this will make me a bad man. This will make me an unsafe man. Mm. So I'm going to disconnect from my masculinity and my mm. power. And it's like, no, no, we need you to be following your power so that we can release the need to protect ourselves. But then be able to, this is why, I, I don't know if a lot of people know this, but I trained in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu for three years. Mm -hmm. And when I first started training, it was in Hoff Gracie's gym. It's one of the most famous gyms in San Francisco. And they would pair me with these huge Brazilian black belt men. So mm -hmm. I'm just this tiny <laughs> petite girl. Mm -hmm. um, and I would just go. They called me Red Brittany because I would just go like I would think about all the things that were frustrating me. And I would just like go for this guy. Mm -hmm. And he would just hold literally just like grab me and just like make sure he didn't hurt me, but just like contain me. <laughs> <laughs> and I just felt like, wow, this is actually what I actually want from a man is like someone who can just energetically and physically hold the container mm -hmm. so that I can, you know, <laughs> I'm like hitting things. I can like freak <laughs> out and then they can just be like, no, everything's okay. Everything's okay. Everything's okay. Um, and I feel like in today's world where we really, I, I want to know what you think about this. Like in today's world, a lot of men are so worried about being unsafe that it's like they don't connect to their like physical power, like literally physically. And so you, s especially also because the world is going into a lot of like desk jobs and mm -hmm. tech and stuff. But I personally, almost all of my past partners have had extensive combat sports. Like mm. one was a boxer, one was in jiu-jitsu, one even Faraday was like, I think he did karate growing up or something. <laughs> or I can't remember. I, what is it? Ka taekwondo? Something like this. But like there was an element of I can defend myself and which made mm -hmm. me feel safer in my body physically. Hmm. I think there is there is definitely something to I haven't I haven't thought about like people who ha don't have this drive for like combat sports and stuff. I've always been really into like boxing and stuff like that but i think there is this huge element of for me it's not even as much of like consciously i need to be able to defend someone else it's more of my relationship with myself and feeling like i'm when i'm doing these things i'm almost teaching my immune system one to be able like yes it's it's true that you get confidence and then and like the ability to defend yourself and others 
but also it's like once you have that confidence then you can be then you can like be in the ring it's almost like if you've ever done a combat sport and you sparred in an actual like live sparring in the ring with someone who doesn't have much experience they're just scared they're like turning away from punches and like opening the back of their head open and like there's just so much more dangerous and then once you have confidence in the ring that's when you can actually start to like flow and play and dance and like experience what it actually feels like to be in a fight um and then I feel like once, once like my immune system and or my nervous system, I keep saying immune system, I don't know why. Once my nervous system kind of like is able to relax in this space, that's when like the actual work occurs. So I don't think it has to be combat sports, but it can be a lot of things. Like I also feel like I get the same thing from ultra running. Mm -hmm. When I was like running, you know, 50, 50 mile, 100K races and like you get this same like in, in the ring survival instinct but it's just you instead it's you in a mountain and you're like you know 40 miles into a race and and extremely tired kind of thing but it's once you kind of prove to your nervous system that you can do this it's almost like you unlock a lot of things because it's it's like trust in your inner father mm -hmm. that allows your your like everyone's divine feminine it really allows you to flourish like safely so I see everything that you're saying, and I cannot vouch necessarily for how women feel, but I can I can see exactly what you're saying reflected in my own inner world of this this safety and this confidence allows my own inner feminine to flourish in a way that expands to like art and expands to the way I can communicate with people and even connect mm -hmm. to women and also connect to other men. It's really important. Yeah, so it's I feel like men need to do that for themselves first, mm -hmm. and then they will have vibrational space for women. But I think if a man does it with the intent, like I'm gonna do this so that I can protect a woman, I've just, I've just seen hypermasculinity played out in some of these mediums in a weird way. I think it. Ha no, it's that's what I mean. You have to do. It. I think yeah, you. Right. Thank you for be. clarifying that because yeah. you have to do it for yourself. Yeah. So what it comes for me, what it makes me think of is like in tribes back in the day, mm -hmm. the men would take the men out for their initiation, like when mm -hmm. they're coming from you know, boyhood into manhood mm -hmm. and they would go into the jungle and or the whatever, the wilderness, wherever they are, mm -hmm. they would go out in the wild and they would do different things. Kind of what you were just saying about running a marathon, like something that is physically hard, something mm -hmm. that is psychologically hard to kind of prove within the man, like the, the person who's becoming a man that he is, he can do it. He has the capacity. He can, he can like, you know, fight for his tribe or accomplish this thing he didn't realize he could do before, but, but he's doing it with the support of all the men around him and his tribe. Mm -hmm. And I feel like today men don't have the support of other men a lot of times. And they also don't even understand that, you know, our, that there is kind of this need for a challenge and an initiation and like you you mm -hmm. put yourself through that subconscious yeah. like intuitively you probably did that without realizing it yeah and then a lot of men don't know this and don't have the intuition to do it and so they just kind of and this is where you were saying is like oh okay well maybe i'll do this so that women like me it's like mm -hmm. no that's not the yeah. initiation you're supposed to do this so you're you are your own man for yourself yeah i think that's actually a huge thing because i think men are encouraged to do an initiation and that initiation is usually like just going to the gym and it's usually <laughs> not for themselves. It's to get women. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's to, and it's, and I feel like that's just missing the point completely. And I completely see that like I've, I've studied some indigenous uh, traditions and read about them and yeah, mm -hmm. I can see how I intuitively just, I mean, back home, everyone thought I was insane. I went from, I had, I had a, I had like never run before <laughs> and never boxed before. And I was just like, I think I'm going to do a 50 mile ultra marathon. And everyone was like, what are you talking about? Like, I'm just like, I, I have to do it. And I knew intuitively and everyone thought I was insane. And honestly, I would have thought I was insane too, if I wasn't me. So but you were following your intuition. And I yeah. think that's what was getting you to the next level of like power for yourself. Right? Yeah, for sure. Because before that, before you, well, this is a question I don't know. Cause I haven't asked you mm -hmm. after that initiation of going through that challenge, is that when you shifted your life to realize that you could be more than what you were? Yeah, that was definitely a huge part of it. I think, I think I was going through a major transformation and uh, a major feeling of lostness, but in retrospect, I wasn't actually lost. I think I knew what I wanted to do. I was just very afraid of 
asking of believing that I could be more and like actually setting my sights on it in a way that was allowing like yourself to dream. Yeah, basically. Because but but th going through that initiation for yourself, it gave you the confidence like, yeah. OK, I can do something hard. Yeah. Okay, here's my dreams. Yeah, this is going to be hard. I can do this. You know, yeah. I mean, I also think that I come from like I knew it intuitively and I knew um, this is getting back to the more spiritual thing. I was actually talking to someone about this, um, this concept because she was telling me about this book called like 100 Years of Psychotherapy and we're still getting worse. And it was about this idea of linear psychotherapy and how like you have traumas that you pick up when you're young and then they transfer to when you're old. But this uh, author was talking about also a bit in the other direction that sometimes we inherit like a purpose and a mission that is so, thank you, a purpose and a mission that is so large and maybe so overwhelming that someone runs away from it. So like someone who turns out, who grows up to be a singer, mm -hmm. doesn't, isn't able to speak until they're like eight and they don't really know why psychologically or something. Interesting. Yeah, and so I see a bit of this because I was like very out of my body as a child and I was very, like I, I did some like intellectual activities, but. You were super disassociated. Yeah, I was super disassociated. I was like super overweight. I weighed like 500 pounds, I think for the German aud audience, that's like 220 kilos or something. I don't know yeah. kilos. <laughs> yeah, um, quick maths, <laughs> but. Yeah, so I could see how, like, all my youth, I knew that I had this, like, mission, I guess. Not to say my mission is to become, like, some professional athlete or something, but I just had this mission that felt very overwhelming, and I was afraid to even begin. Mm -hmm. And then so it kind of went in this, like, opposite of me, like, actually starting to realize that I had to do it, and then... Wait, you subconsciously ran away from it Yeah, no, for sure. Is that for, what like, you The saying? first, like, 20 two years of my life or something yeah but i i forget the original question what if i went off on that tangent it's okay it's a good tangent i think i just want to come back to like i was talking to a friend yesterday and he's mm -hmm. german mm -hmm. and 24 years old and he's a guy he's mm -hmm. a man and he asked me he said Brittany, i'm you know i'm not asking you what to do but mm -hmm. I am kind of asking you what to do. <laughs> He's like, I know you coach a lot of men and just also like, you know, you're working with this like divine masculine and feminine polarity and trying to find the balance and all of this. And he's like, I want to be one of these good men in the timeline. Like, what would you say to a man who's 24 years old? And like, w what would you suggest he do with his life? And mm. I was like, oh, this is a good question. I want to talk about this on the podcast. Um, mm. But you're a man. <laughs> so yeah. I thought maybe I'd ask you first. I think that one of the biggest things that changed my life is like I mean it's probably something that you would al already suggest like this journaling aspect but asking this one question of what would you do if you had absolutely no fear like what would you do with your life mm -hmm. I think this question really cuts through a lot because I mean I could answer that question very very simply when I asked myself that question like I, w I would be a musician like uh, it was it was so simple to me and and you're a very good musician. Oh, thank you. But um, I think that's the first thing that I would ask the person, because I think in reality, everyone knows. Yeah, I think we like do. Everyone actually knows. And it's not even like you have to do that much searching. Like maybe I think sometimes we can get a bit confused because we know we know what it feels like, but we don't. There's no like. What, what we're supposed to do is like a bit creative in that there's not like a job position for it or something. So well, you have to think a little bit outside the box, but like, yeah. Yeah, because right now the world is in a huge transition phase. Mm -hmm. You know, like even when I graduated high school, it was 2008 and this is when the stock market in the US crashed. Mm -hmm. So like my parents lost their house. All mm -hmm. of my friends' parents lost their retirement funds. And I'm about to go to university and I'm like, like you know like all this traditional path that everyone has programmed us for mm -hmm. i had a very real experience of the fact that that doesn't really exist anymore so and that i'm 34 now so like this generation of us like younger everyone can kind of tell like the old way of doing things doesn't really work anymore but mm -hmm. we don't necessarily have a new way of doing things yeah and so this is why everyone i think is trying to figure it out because 
um, we're a lot more awake and embodied as souls, like the ones that are coming in. We have a lot more resources and support. Mm. And yet, you know, I think it's really important to, the thing that I would say is don't be afraid to play the game of life. Mm, Because something that I'm really realizing being off the island right now, off Copenhagen, is the last couple of years I feel like I knew what I needed to do in the world, but the island's so comfortable and mm. I love my community there. Yeah. And it was just like, I was making just enough impact that I felt like it was justifiable, you know, mm-hmm. like hosting parties, running retreats, doing coaching online. But I know what my mission is and yeah. I'm building that out right now with some friends and it's very big and it's like global. And, and I feel like a part of the reason why I stayed on the island was because we created a reality there on Copenhagen. If you've never been, I really recommend visiting before you judge what I'm about to say. <laughs> but it feels the closest I've ever felt to a like a society that runs on its own. It's not just like an eco village that you go to and someone runs it. But like Copenhagen runs itself. Like you go there and like there's tons of spiritual things happening. There's spontaneous meetups on the beach. Everyone's playing music all the time. It's just like Everyone's just vibing and flowing, right? But it's really easy sometimes to get caught up that that is life. But Mm -hmm. we came here, our souls came here in this transition phase to help with the transition. Mm -hmm. So I I have started to realize that Copanyang is like a place to go and like heal your stuff and really figure out what you're meant to do in the world and then go out and do the thing, you Mm -hmm. know? Like I, because I come from a corporate backgrounds and I literally have trauma in my body from working in corporate I don't recommend that for anyone but that doesn't mean that I shouldn't do things in the world and I think that's what I was I was basically felt like now I look back and I feel like I was hiding a little bit because I know what I meant to do and yeah I need to play the game of life and like this beautiful way of like building a business and helping people making impact and traveling, all these things. And I love all those things. I just, in the past, I associated them with working in corporate, which I really wow. didn't love. Yeah, that that actually gave me, thank you for that. That gave me a lot of insight because I think to change my answer based on what you just downloaded into me, it's also not just that you know what to do. It's I'd say it's kind of like multiple things. It's that ask yourself that if you didn't have fear, what would you do? And if you don't get a clear image know that that's a good thing because that means that what you're trying what you're supposed to do is not being done already and that means that your mission is even more important and a lot of people talk about oh you need to go fail don't be afraid to fail i think i mean failure doesn't even really make sense in my in my perspective if you do something and then you figure out that it's not the right thing that's not i don't see how really that's failure but basically don't be afraid to be wrong because being wrong is figuring it out. And the last thing is do it before you're ready to do it. Yeah, that's how you figure it out. There's so many things where I went into and I'm talking about faking it till you make it. Like I had no clue what I was doing. Like if, (laughs) if you, if you like for music, I could say my first experience performing, which wasn't that long ago was just, wow, just, I just like froze on stage, like everything. And if you, and if your first like time doing something isn't, doesn't go really wrong, then you've waited too long, I think. You're saying like messing up or yeah. quote unquote making mistakes is part yeah, of it. If you, if you like prepared so long that you didn't make mistakes, then I personally think you waited too long. Yeah. Someone said something to me the other day. It's like, um, I think it was Faraday actually. He said something like, it's good to be bad at things because yeah. that means that there's it's life life worth living like yeah. is, that means you just figure it out and you like get better at it but it's yeah. fun yeah and you figure it out way faster when you allow yourself to be bad at it yeah i i i i think i needed to hear that because um i've gotten really good at the things that i do mm-hmm. and so do not good at something i just kind of outsource it to other people yeah that's <laughs> but a, like that's music a place to be <laughs> yeah and like you were such an inspiration for me to get back into my music stuff because i grew up loving to sing and playing mm-hmm. drums and stuff and just being around you and seeing how you're just like going for it and i love singing together and mm-hmm. it just makes me yeah, it's like my inner child is just so happy. Hmm. But I wanted to say something else is something I'm realizing a lot recently is that 
being spiritually awakened, Mm -hmm. one half of it is understanding what's happening in the world and the structure of reality. But really the, what I'm realizing is the other half that's sometimes even more important is allowing yourself to go do things in the world with that information, like the embodiment. Yeah. So a lot of people who are spiritually awake right now, uh, a lot of you who are listening to this podcast, it's almost like sometimes we can get in this mindset where we're thinking doing things in the 3D world is below us. It will mm-hmm. lower our vibration. That is not true. This is actually part of what we're meant to do. We're meant to carry this high vibration into the world to affect it in different ways. And like sometimes even just you being in your job at work, which may be surrounded by quote unquote low vibration or not as spiritual people, can activate them subconsciously to raise their vibration or to go on their spiritual path. So you don't realize the impact that you're making, but you're supposed to go out and do things. You're not supposed to just sit on Copanyang <laughs> and this like, is, you know uh, what I mean? No, I know exactly what you mean. This is, um, this is something that like is so important to me in my own process. It's mm. kind of the, I mean, it's the logic behind, uh, I started a podcast recently grounded on clouds and it's, the idea of grounded on clouds is just being in between heaven and earth. And it's a recognition that you can get getting spiritually high is it's it's getting high and that you can and that you can get high. And from that perspective, you can kind of lose you can lose sight and lose feeling and lose touch with the embodiment and like the earth mm-hmm. and that the actual point of you weren't given a human body and given a human mind to not experience them. You weren't given these things to push them away. There's so much wisdom and part of your process and what you are going to go through on your own spiritual path is in here. It's in here. It's your relationship with your body and your mind. It's like this yoga that you get to constantly practice. It's like this avenue for meditation that's always there, but only if you allow yourself to be in it. And that's something that on Kopangan even, I mean, and this is, I love Kopangan. It's like, home to me yeah same but there's a lot of pushing away of things that are yeah deemed too low or too you mean by the community there yeah yeah by the community there spiritual what is it spiritual ego yeah and and a feeling of because we're getting high in a way that's not drugs and alcohol Mm -hmm. that it's good inherently and that like getting high is very necessary but only if to keep us in a balance because a lot of people come with like a lot of trauma and they're too grounded in the earth and they're not connected mm-hmm. or spiritually awakened and they need to get high. They need to go and do breath work. They need ecstatic ayahuasca dance. ceremonies. They need ecstatic dance. Yeah. They need yoga. But then you can just, you can get addicted to that thing in exactly the same way that, you know. It's yeah. like my godfather said it the other day. He's like, everyone thinks they're escaping the, the matrix by going to Copenhagen, but it's just a different matrix. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I was like, oh my God, is that true? <laughs> it's super true. Yeah. <laughs> It's definitely true. And I've seen it. I've seen it in my own. Like, I've I gotten, think we all yeah. go through it. It's a phase. You Just like you have to get you have to get trapped in the whole bodily thing and like, you know, depression, anxiety, whatever. Like, I don't know if you have stuff. to, but it definitely is a thing. I've but gone like, through it. I mean, you you have to get attached. Basically, you have to get attached to the body and like the mind. And then you have to get attached to the spiritual thing. And then you can find a, the balance yeah, in the middle. Yeah. yeah you kind of have. But to. I find it funny that you call your podcast. What is it? Grounded in the clouds. Grounded on clouds. Yeah. Because I thought the point is to bring heaven to earth, not to be. No, in, in it's the clouds are in between heaven and earth. But isn't that purgatory? Isn't no. that a different dimension? Basically, the idea is you're uh, in like in ancient in some ancient spiritual literature. They talk about standing nowhere. So like standing in heaven is having a perspective of looking down on earth. It's still pushing something away and standing yes. standing on earth is l- like pushing away heaven essentially. So it's standing in both and being able to observe both. So holding both polarities. Yeah, holding both polarities and like I mean it's it's actually uh, my practice it a lot in like ecstatic dance and other practices but it's feeling this high this feeling your vibration rising. And instead of kind of riding that wave, just observing it. And, you know, it's, we get, we practice and get really good at seeing like, oh, like fear, like these kind of things. And like, I'm just going to observe it. But then when, you know, the high comes along, we're just like, oh, let me on that, wa- let me on that wave. Well, I, I think that's the that point one. of like looking at your shadows. Yeah, so exactly. That you're not just looking at the good things. If you push away all the good things, then you do ayahuasca and they all come back. Yeah. But also, it's not even just looking at them at a point. You want to have the same relationship to the earth that you have to the heavens. So you want to love the feeling 
the feeling of fear, like you want to befriend the feeling of fear and the mind at the same way that you befriend the feeling that you get when you're dancing all night with friends. And oh, you're talking to a Scorpio. I'm all about <laughs> making friends with my shadow. Yeah, I love that. <laughs> like, I can tell. It was like full moon this last weekend and we were talking yesterday about like, how was your full moon? I'm like, I was in bed eating chocolate and really <laughs> overwhelmed and I just let myself do it. <laughs> mm-hmm. That's inspiring. Yeah. Hmm. Um, do you want to ask me a question? Ooh. I could go so many different directions right now, but I oh. now I'm like, let's pull the wild card. Oh, okay. Asking Brittany a question. Mm-hmm. Hmm. What? Oh, I guess we'll. Ju- I'll just ask you the question I asked them. If you had no fear at all, what's the next chapter in your life? Oof. Okay. Um, what would you do? Go to Burning Man with my friends. Mm -hmm. Go spend time with my girlfriend, Michaela, in Washington State and Mm. run retreats and play parties for her community up there, her conscious community, and then rent a car and drive around the Pacific Northwest, which is where I'm from. I'm from California, and most of my family is in the state above, which is Oregon. So drive around, see my family I haven't seen in like 10 years or longer. And integrate a lot of stuff that I have been, you know, doing my best to heal from. But I think that's something about going home. And I haven't gone home in Mm -hmm. 10 years. Um, And, yeah, launching all of these courses and different retreats and different things with Daria, my friend I'm working with here. And just allowing myself to be this leader in this lifetime like allowing myself to come fully into that because there's been so many like spiritual channelings that I've had and I've shared some of them with you about like many of my past lives have been me dealing with you know being a spiritual leader in a community and having to ask like the the fight the finding the balance between my own personal freedom and my responsibility to serve my community um, so right now I've spent a lot of the last couple of years uh, in my own personal freedom like yeah I'm serving the community on Copenhagen but I know that my bigger mission is to serve the community globally mm. um, and I think I've been kind of afraid of that the last mm-hmm. couple of years, not because I'm worried it wouldn't work. I know it's going to work and like it's going to help people and make the impact it's meant to make. Um, but more of the responsibility that comes with it, like afraid that I will lose <laughs> being my happy inner flowy child. You know, like a lot of people, it's funny because a lot of people the last couple of years, um, have seen me in the vibration of doing my best to ground Faraday. But you know me, mm-hmm. like, after Faraday and I broke up, like, you and I were connecting. And me and my normal self is just this very eclectic, quirky person who's <laughs> just always making jokes and funny and wearing the funniest clothes and excited to go smash things. You know, like, <laughs> I'm just like, let's go on this adventure, you know? So that's really who I am at my core. And... um I'm excited to allow both parts of myself to be in full integration where Mm -hmm. I can be my authentic, quirky, rising Aquarius self and also, yeah, be fully like integrated in allowing myself to be this powerful leader that I meant to be in the world so that it can activate and inspire others to be in their power. Mm. Like for like we talked about this for a while about like how, um, yeah, yeah, it's a lot um, about how I feel like right now in my life is like the perfect moment for all of these things to fall into place because if I had done it earlier, I wouldn't have healed a lot of my trauma. And so, you've seen people get famous when they are not healed. You know, yes. it's just like they have this microphone for sending their vibration out but their vibration's not clear and it's mm. not really helping people it's, it's just also much less of a conscious decision it's just someone realized that they could profit off this person and then so they were propelled not because yeah you're in just such a conscious a conscious position of mm-hmm. walking yourself into that posi- into the position of fame yeah and I, I and I do it for the collective I think that's mm-hmm. the thing is a lot of people want to be famous or make impact but really what they want to do is 
feed their ego or make money, you know? Yeah. And I'm like, honestly, I would be happiest on Uncle Wen Young with my dog Afro mm. being at waterfalls naked, but I know this is actually what my higher self wants me to do is like yeah. go out and help people and inspire them. Uh, my human design literally says that like, I'm meant to like create a new society. That's literally yeah. what it says, but it says I have to be careful that people don't think that I'm abandoned. What does it say? Something about like, abandoning the old one like uh, seen as seen as a deserter that's what it says uh, so i have to like yeah. do it in a very specific way which i have built a lot of community over my life and i've played out the parts where people felt left behind or they felt like you know i didn't pick them or something and this and that and now i've learned a lot of this and some mm -hmm. of this was my own trauma and some of this was really bad boundaries <laughs> 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 and so now i like feel like i know how to do it in a way that's inclusive and um, serving everyone. I see. It sounds like a lot of expansion, mm. a lot of going back into places and into loops that you may have felt like you left and having to, yeah, like really make conscious breakages and changes. And I mean, I can see why this is what you would do if you had no fear because... Yeah, we were like laying in bed yesterday talking about it. And you're like, how do you feel about it? I'm like, I am absolutely terrified. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just so terrified to go back to the States. And that's when I know I actually need to do yeah. it. Fear is such an insanely good guide. <laughs> I know. Oh, my gosh. It's, yeah, I can tell this is exactly aligned. And I can also feel like in your body the fear. I'm not even touching you. I can just feel the fear. You can and touch me if you want. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> But, <laughs> yeah, I can feel the fear, and that's such a good sign because, yeah, I know I kind of put you on the spot, but now... No, I appreciate but now it. Everyone, now everyone knows. I know. <laughs> I mean, like, I've been kind of quiet about it because I'm in the middle of figuring everything out and mm -hmm. really demanding from the universe, like, a clear answer in a way that feels good for me yeah. of, like, when I'm supposed to go in what way. Am I supposed to go to Burning, Burning mm. Man or not? And I have a lot of invitations from friends for different things in the mm. States, but... Um, You've just projected it into the cosmos, though. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but the the story I was sharing with you yesterday was, like, when I was 24 years old and, like, sitting in my apartment with Harlem. all my... Yeah, in, in Upper Harlem with all my bags packed in New York City, like, ready to go s traveling and, like, m leave my very cushy law firm job, my really beautiful apartment with one of my closest friends, and just go traveling with my travel company that I had mm -hmm. started with two people I'd never met in real life at this point yeah. yet. You know, like I was like, and I just sat there with my bags packed, ready to go to the airport. And I just had started panicking. I was like, am I making the right decision? Am I completely stupid right now? Like I, everyone's telling me to stay. Like I have, I make such good money at my job. I have like a really nice life here in New York city and I knew, and I was so excited to m go on an adventure. So I was like, yeah. But then I, w I just thought I don't have any family. I don't have mm. that much. At the time, I didn't have that much like m money saving. So I, I had put all my money into the business that we had started. And I was just like, am I really making like a bad practical decision? Mm. Like from like a 3D standpoint, is this mm -hmm. like a bad decision? <laughs> and I just remember thinking like, I can't really go back from here. So I'm literally putting it all in. And, and, uh, yeah, I was really, really scared in that moment. Mm. And then you asked me, well, what happened after that? And I'm like, well, you know, eight years later, 70 countries later, <laughs> many beautiful relationships later, um, and community built and money made and lost and made again. Yeah. It's been one, one hell of a ride mm. and I'm so grateful I did it. I'm so grateful I don't live in New York city right now going to a nine to five job in a law firm <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but just, now yeah. I feel that same feeling about going back to the states yeah and the same feeling of people thinking you're like a little crazy yeah I, I'm also finding that because like I have such a beautiful life I've built here in Thailand yeah. I've lived here based here for nine years that's been that's been true for all of the best decisions I've ever made in my life is there's going to be like a pocket of people maybe a lot of people that think you're a little bit crazy mm-hmm I think you're, and I know even when I came here to Asia and just like I bought a one-way ticket to Hanoi, Vietnam, and I was like, I just feel so random. It's because I mean the world is, we're very 
we're very estranged from like our higher purpose and our higher selves and the world is a bit ill right now and it's super ill that's why all of us star seeds were sent here to yeah, I help i say a bit ill because i don't want to you know hurt anyone's feelings but it's extremely ill <laughs> yeah you don't have to. I mean, everyone <laughs> who's watching this podcast agrees with you okay yeah but they're also looking for hope they're looking yeah. for some grounded the direction. world is very ill so if no one thinks that you're crazy and they think what you're doing is completely logical you should really think hard about you what should you're run doing. Just you should <laughs> <laughs> just kidding <laughs> you should think hard about what you're doing and see if it's your highest truth yeah and so life. many people message me and they say like yeah i have this idea that i am meant to do this in the world but i have no family support i have no community support mm. everyone just says that i should do the next logical thing and i'm like yeah but right now in this time period in the world is the time to do those big things those things that are transformational those things that are spiritually aligned with what you feel your soul is calling you to do and if you allow yourself to follow your intuition, it always works out. That's what I was wanting to say is that my intuition right now is calling me to go back to the States. I have no clue what's going to happen when I go back. I don't know how mm -hmm. it's going to affect me. I can, I can in my mind, theorize yeah. all of these things. But I don't know. Like I, just, uh, yeah. I don't know. But like the point of life is to have these lived experiences yeah. and to put yourself out there and see what happens. Yeah, I know for like my own career, I have to go back to the West soon. And like on paper, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. It kind of does, but I also just know it has to be. Um, and yeah, that's it's going to be a adventure <laughs> either way. <laughs> I think it'll be good for you. Yeah. There's something to like. I, let's talk about us for a minute because oh, yeah. so many people are going to be like what is what are you guys doing oh. do you love him what's yeah, happening defend your position defend my position oh my god <laughs> we should share that story <laughs> <laughs> so uh josh and i met how did we meet was it at a static uh, dance yeah it was a static dance after Copenhagen. you were wearing this flower in your hair I and was. i said i like your flower in your hair and then we started talking and then there was just kind of an instant connection. Mm -hmm. And I went home and wrote a poem about yes. you. Wow. Such a beautiful poem. Yeah, that's beautiful. Mm -hmm. And then Faraday and I, so we just met, like nothing mm -hmm. romantic or anything happened. I think I thought you were dating someone else. You were kind of seeing someone else. There was, she was crazy girl. Yeah. Crazy girl. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I was dating, <laughs> I was dating Faraday and um, yeah, I, I'm not, kind of what I talked about in my other podcast is like what I realized with Faraday is like when I actually was living in the relationship experience, I didn't want to date anyone else. I was just committed to him. Mm -hmm. So that's what I did. And then f all that shit happened with Faraday and I, and we broke up. Mm -hmm. And then like a week later after Faraday moved out, I saw you again at a psych dance. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of just this magical experience. I'll let you go from here. Okay. Pick it up well, where I left it off. Um, and we meet at Ecstatic Dance, <laughs> and we start dancing, and we become very intertwined <laughs> energetically <laughs> as well as physically in the dance. And I actually, uh, I had been running a freestyle rap workshop that week. Mm -hmm. So uh, on like Wednesday or Tuesday or something, I met Faraday for the first time, and he came up to me. And he like just he rapped a little bit in our cipher, and then he like told me that he he wanted to get my number or something, so he got my number, and then he walked away. And so I I met Faraday a little bit, and uh, yeah, so we were dancing, and then you told me that yeah you broke up with Faraday, and I told you I'm happy to hang out with you, but I might cry the whole time. Yeah, you said as long as you're okay with me crying and I was uh, I'm very okay with that <laughs> so I really enjoyed being around your energy even mm. in that place not even in that place especially in that in that way you were just so open and I know it, the way you were and allowing yourself to be in that like vulnerable place just really opened something within my own heart of even more like with our dance and with just not only the authenticity but like the energetic authenticity of like yeah, of just being so sad and happy at the same time. <laughs> that was really, that was me. It was powerful. It was, I was wow. I was all of it. Yeah, you were, you, were, you were all of it and like 
presented yourself as all of it and were like, look, I'm all of it. Are you okay with that? I'm like, oh, yes, I I would love that. I just felt like we, when I was dancing with you that day, it was, it was, it was like the movies where the people are dancing on the dance floor and then everyone else fades away. Yeah. That's how I felt like. I just felt like. And time. Also. And time. Yeah. Just, it was just, we were just in this bubble mm-hmm. of each other. Yeah. And it was really, that's really what I needed. I just needed to take a break from all of the sadness. Yeah. And then at the... I needed to just yeah. rest in your energy a lot. That was... Yeah. I also felt completely bubbled, like floating. It was really wonderful. Hmm. I really loved it. How at the sound healing... So after a static dance, like, they do the sound healing where they do, like, um, what is it, like, crystal bowls or metal bowls where they... Or someone plays a flute. Or it's like, imagine grounding kind of organic acoustic music that happens and then you like lay down and you can meditate to like ground yourself after dancing a lot Mm -hmm. and we um so everyone sat down and i laid in your arms and i just remember like looking you in the eye like i was like laying on your chest Mm -hmm. and like looking at you in the eye and i just was crying so hard and i would open my eyes and you would just be still holding the space like you did not blink it seemed like you didn't look away you were just like energetically holding this really safe container for me and Mm. that felt so opposite of what i had just been dealing with with faraday of like gaslighting betrayal everything and it was it was really healing for me to have a masculine energy and a presence who's just like i'm here i'm not going anywhere i'm here i'm here it's okay you can feel all the things and i'm still here and that made me cry even more. And then I remember like laughing also. Like it was really just all the things. And then I think you cried a little bit. Yeah. Why did you it was cry? such a, yeah, you're making me realize how much of a beautiful exchange this is because obviously holding that space was like such a gift and such a joy for me. But then also just you bringing in this like, this feminine, like gentle crumbling that just like, allowed it to mirror to mirror i allowed myself to kind of mirror that in my own heart where i needed to where i needed to crumble Mm. and also just it's i honestly think it's one of the most beautiful things in the world where people feel when people feel their emotions like they feel safe enough to just feel something so deeply and i don't know i think that's literally the essence of what we're trying to get to with all art and music is can be encapsulated in like these moments when you're just holding someone and they're crying and they're feeling everything like that's what i want anyone to feel in any song that i ever create your songs make me cry i have literally cried from your music thank you um so then we hung out Mm -hmm. for like two weeks after that and the mm-hmm. first week because he already he already knew he was going up to Pi, so mm-hmm. he was like i don't want to make love with you because something like this needs to be nurtured this connection if we open this container and i don't want to just like leave uh, leave after a week this is what you said yeah. right yeah um that is, that is the logic that is the logic um i think you said something like you deserve for if someone is going to open that to like have it be like nourished yeah. and like nurtured. And also I deserve that too. Yeah. I feel like yeah. everyone deserves yeah. that because otherwise it can feel like your body or your psyche can feel like abandoned. Like we're connecting. Oh, now bye. Yeah. <laughs> it's a very strong energetic connection that I also have just realized is it's, it can't, I can't make the decision to do that just out of like some kind of like physical or emotional need. Like if, if, all the needs within my own body can be satisfied with like connection and even like physical touch and like emotional connection. But like when I want to make the step of actually having sex, especially like penetrative sex with someone, it's a very, it's like creating a bond. It's like a connect. It's like, it's a conscious decision to make a bond and it can't be from a, you know, some kind of desire or need. It's like, I don't know. It's a very, very I think it needs to to come out of abundance, not scarcity. Exactly. Where most people are doing it out of scarcity because they want some need met. Mm -hmm. Validation, connection, love. But having sex doesn't mean someone loves you. Yeah. Like for me, I think about it. It's like we're literally making an energetic baby every Mm -hmm. time you make love with someone. And it's, it's actually very confusing to like the nervous system. I feel to make love when you feel like you have a need because you're teaching your body that, 
this need these needs are met by sex I'm oh like, that's bad yeah exactly i mean <laughs> i just mean like that's unhealthy that's yeah <laughs> my emotional reaction oh no <laughs> yeah no, exactly. no. <laughs> so yeah that's why i really have i really feel strongly about that but and then yeah. you can tell them what happened after that. <laughs> and then what happened after that was we have very great chemistry and mm. it just was very hard to <laughs> not make love. <laughs> and then I was hosting a play party the next weekend. Oh, yes. My first so play party. It was jo- Josh's first play party. And that was really beautiful because um, in the beginning of the play party, I asked you... Um, like, do you want to go through this experience together or do you want to be like a single person? Because mm-hmm. um, at this point we hadn't made love. We hadn't, you know, we mm-hmm. were just really close to each other. And you said you wanted to go through it together. Mm-hmm. And that made me feel really good because, well, then we talked about also like, what does that mean? And wh- what did you, I, don't, I can't remember what you said. I think something around like just checking in with each other. Yeah, yeah. I think it was just checking in with each other. And then you said that it would feel really good and like safe for you if w- the first people we played with were each other. Mm-hmm. And I like seconded that. I was like, oh, yeah. I didn't even think about that. But <laughs> yes. Yeah. So that great. was really nice. And it was such a fun party in yeah. general. Like it was a lot of our friends there. <laughs> we were having such a good time that the next day someone asked us, were you guys making love at the play party? <laughs> and I was like, no, we haven't even made love yet in general. <laughs> and also, like, why would I break my own play party rules? Yeah, they thought, they thought <laughs> the organizer broke the rules. Yeah, but that's They're just... just on another level of dry humping. <laughs> 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 we were just having a really good time. Yeah, that's true. Uh, yeah, and that was really healing for me to go through that party experience with you because I felt like with past partners, um, not going to mention any names, but I didn't feel like I felt like they said all the right things, but energetically, I didn't feel like we were on the same team. Mm. And with you, I really felt like we really are were on the same team and we did want to protect each other's hearts. Yeah. And that was the main goal. Like it didn't really matter if we played with other people or not like, yeah, it's fun. It's beautiful to share this energy and to heal each other. But like the most important thing is that we go come out of this feeling like we're on the same team. And I really felt that at the end I was like, wow, that was so like this for me, it was like proving that it's possible to do that with a Mm. partner because yeah, I just had a lot of bad experience with that with my last partner. Mm -hmm. Um, And then we went and did mushrooms Oh, yeah. Yeah, we did. Yeah. Well, you did a lot of I mushrooms. I did a lot of mushrooms. You did like, how was it? Like, like seven, seven or eight grams. Seven or eight grams of mushrooms. mushrooms. Wow. First time you really, like your first real mushroom trip. Yeah. We went with him and uh, his one of his best friends, Ray. Yeah, let's just say <laughs> if you do that many mushrooms, be prepared for. First off, I don't recommend anyone yeah, doing that many mushrooms. Yeah. I think, why did you? Cause, because I said I've done that in the past. Yeah, something like that. And also I'd done mushrooms before, but I'd never really tripped. But. I think you're just bigger than most, like you're literally like taller, bigger than most yeah. people. And then also it is, <laughs> it does correlate to how much you control your mental hmm. mind. And if you feel safe to drop in. Yeah. So I think maybe you felt safe with also, us. Yeah. With you and Ray, my, my friend. Oh uh, yeah. Just really holding space for me. I mean, mm-hmm. yeah, it turned out to be an extremely positive experience. Yeah. It was yeah. really fun. I just took a tiny micro, but then being in your energy, yeah. I felt like I was on a whole trip. I was like, I need to go down to the beach. <laughs> I need to ground. Zip around the cosmos. Now <laughs> I can, yeah, I can s- see past lives and stuff or parallel lives. Yeah, definitely opening a lot of your spiritual psychic yeah, things. Yeah, uh, that interesting. was really fun. And then we were basically like in Tongsadet in the most magical bungalow overlooking the sea. And Ray had gone home and we were just like, what better place to make love than like right here? Yeah, that was a nice place. (laughs) I think she had left like less than five minutes before we were already like having sex. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. She was like probably at the bottom of the (laughs) stairs. Um, And then we connected for a week before you left for Pi. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we lived together. (laughs) Oh, my God. So many timelines. So Josh and Ray were living together, his friends, and uh, they were supposed to leave on Wednesday. And mm-hmm. then we were like, oh, we want to hang out longer. So he ended up staying with Anna and I. For like three or four days, maybe? Yeah, until like okay. Saturday or something. Yeah. Wow. So many lives we've lived yeah. already. 
Yeah, we have. And like so many experiences within those that like no time to share here, but like really beautiful. Yeah. Um, and then you left for Pi and then I was just kind of like, I was really in this moment where I was like, I know what I want in my next partner mm-hmm. and I care about you so much. And I know mm-hmm. that if I, <laughs> so basically I know what I want and I know my energy. So mm-hmm. as the feminine, if I start dating someone and they're not what I want, my energy is going to try and Make get you uh, to be that. Yes. Yeah. Which is what happened in my last relationship. Yeah. And I saw how that went. Um, so I just was like, let's basically like set all these things in a really mm-hmm. nice way. And was super authentic and open. Yeah. Also just a recognition that we're just in different parts of our lives. I mean, yeah. I'm 28, so I'm a bit younger. Mm-hmm. And that, yeah, it was very kind of you to realize that I'm also in a part of my life where a lot of things are changing and I feel like you really respected that and wanted it to be in a way like wanted didn't like what you were just saying didn't want to influence that in a way in which you were yeah I don't want to push you to be something that you're not or yeah. you I don't know if you even want to be whatever whatever yeah, you know exactly. like I'm 34 I know I've I have lived yeah. so many lives already yeah, exactly. I've built such a beautiful life that is stable mm-hmm. and abundant and everything and I just I'm excited to partner with someone who's in that stable, yeah. abundant mode. And yeah. it's, I know you're going to be the most famous musician ever <laughs> and, you know, get everything that you want in your life. And it's beautiful that you're allowing yourself to be in this phase right now of building towards mm-hmm. that and like going for it. And I want to be able to be your friend and like support you in mm-hmm. the best way that I can. And like the best way I can do that is to be your friend. Yeah. And I also feel like it's an echo of your dedication to the value and concept of freedom and that, yeah, I feel like it's such a beautiful thing in a relationship for me to be able to choose the person I want to be in like a flux and like my Saturn's return and everything. Mm-hmm. You like allow someone to really go through that and be the person who they want to be and like feel like they need to be. And then and then you can like, it's kind of just like allowing someone to be free and allow things to unfold the way they're supposed to. Yeah, and I really liked it that when we were talking about this, like after you'd left, you were just like, um, you said something that really stuck out to me. And it was like, I, of course, this is something like, of course, this is not what I want to hear. But also, I am grateful that you're creating, you know, you're shifting my, our relationship so that it feels safe for you. Yeah. So it was like honoring me that this is what I need for my own safety. And also, I think you said like, it motivates me to build a life where you know someone like you like i can partner with someone like you in the future and i really love that it's also like it's it's such a gift to it's it's feels like you choosing to to love me exactly the way i am Mm -hmm. yeah that's really what it feels like you recognizing that you don't actually want to change me no and i think if i consciously I could feel that pressure if we were to like yeah. continue and then there were things about me that you wanted to change, then that would be felt. It's yeah, inevitable definitely. that that would be felt. And, and I think like, know, I'm just very kind of you. Thank you. I just like, I think the last relationship I had just really locked this in for me that it's serving no one. Mm-hmm. If I am not honest with what I want and yeah. like communicative and making sure that the person actually matches that. Yeah. Cause yep. then they're going to just constantly feel like they're a failure around me. Yeah. And that's not, yeah, you it's not helping anyone or I'm going to waste all of my, not waste, but spend all of my energy trying to help them get to, to the point Instead where. Instead of on you and yeah. this epic journey that you're about yeah. to embark on. That's why I know like the next partner that I have, like, they're gonna, I have a list. I write it out every day. I meditate on it. And they're going to have a list and then you're going to be yes. like, <laughs> yeah. look at our list. They, they match, they match up. <laughs> yeah. And my friend Daria yesterday, this is something for all y'all to know is that if you write a list of the partner that you want to be with, I found out yesterday, which I did this now, you need to write a list of what you can offer your partner. Mm. So like energetically, resource wise, emotionally, whatever it is, but just like, who are you going to be for your partner? What can you offer them? Because then, yeah, they're going to have their own list or the, you know, in their mind's eye, they're going to have this image of who they want to be with. And you're sending vibrational signals out like, Hey, yeah, I am this person. I can offer this. And then they're like, you know, and then you can find each other. Yeah. I think that's really beautiful. I do too. So the last part of the story about us is yesterday we hung out for the first time since 
all of this happened. Mm -hmm. And like, the <laughs> Brittany <laughs> kept trying to kiss me over and Not over. Not on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> like he comes in and I'm just like waking up from a nap and then he comes to hug me and I just like go in for a kiss because the last time our bodies were together, yeah. we were like living together, making yeah. love all the time. So it's yeah. like my body needed some time to catch up. <laughs> 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 and then we like and then i was like do you want me to pull tarot on us and then i pulled tarot and it was like what was it seven of wands or something seven of wands and high priestess. high priestess and i and i casually just said oh the high priestess always represents me in the cards because mm -hmm. i when i ever asked the tarot deck like who am i in, in the tarot or in the timeline or whatever it always pulls high priestess so i looked this up mm -hmm. on chat gpt just so everyone knows I'm using ChatGPT. I feel like an accomplished yeah. person, yeah. but I use it for my tarot readings. And it said like, defend your position. <laughs> and like, you've basically like, I made the decision that I'm holding vibrational space for the partner that mm -hmm. I want. And I needed to actually defend this yeah. and not like defend it against you, but more like within myself, like stick to what I say I want because mm -hmm. I've had so many times in the past, I'm really good at manifesting things, but they say like when you hold this vortex open of vibrational space, the universe kind of like sends you different options. Mm. And so you can say like, thank you, but no. And then mm -hmm. they'll send you another one. Okay, this one's a little bit closer to what you wanted. Yeah. Okay, thank you, but no. Like I'll stay friends with all these people. We'll keep them in my life. Mm -hmm. And then they keep sending you like more and more closer match to what you asked for. Mm -hmm. But you have to hold your boundaries of what, what you actually want. Say, and saying, no, thank you. I want like whatever this is and i felt like yesterday it's just like our energy together I remember <laughs> we were like out <laughs> watching music and i was like i you're not helping me and holding my ground you kept making jokes about like well, defend your position i was like i was helping you by testing you and, I, <laughs> and allowing you to defend your position me. yes i was it's like training not. soldier you know defend your position and i was like i need more help this is not you know when I was like twisting your nipple at the jazz show, I was oh helping my God, train you. <laughs> <laughs> we had a good time last night. We did not have sex. Yeah. Mission or kiss. accomplished. Or kiss. We have yeah. not kissed. I have dodged like seven though. <laughs> Probably more than that. I, I said when you came over today, I was like, let's transition it slowly. A kiss on the cheek. Yeah. So then, because my body just naturally goes for it. Yeah. And your body just naturally looks at me like this, like... <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean yesterday you're, you're like blaming me <laughs> yesterday you're like well i'm not gonna go for it but i'm not gonna push it away i mean <laughs> what am i supposed to do like constantly be like <laughs> like a chicken yeah like uh, you're you're putting the blame on me when i'm, I'm just not blaming at, you at all at you, there's no blame there's <laughs> there's no blame here you know how easy it would be for me to just kiss you back when you go in for the kiss I'm proud of you that Thank you are you. helping me hold it. Well, this is what I asked you yesterday is if mm -hmm. you had what you wanted, what would it be? Yeah. What would it be ah. about us? Well, I mean, if I was the person that you needed to date, it would be definitely dating you. So you're saying if I, if you matched my list, yeah, do I match your like list? I, yeah. But I think it's also like what we just talked about. I don't, I, it's very important to me to not be in a relationship where the person feels like they need to change me. Yeah. yeah. So I don't match your list. Yeah. From that, you don't match my yeah. list. Yeah. But yeah, I've experienced that before. And even if it's like subtle, it's like I, I mean, I'm traveling a lot now and going around the globe and I've been in relationships where like the person really wants to like settle down in one place and do the whole get a, get a desk job in a house life. And, and I'm a baby. Like, yeah. And I'm like, I can't do that right now. Yeah. And so. Be free, yeah, Mr. Rising Sagittarius. <laughs> Be free. Thank you. Um, so that's our story. Yeah. It's a good one. So we're going to go smash one. things soon. But do you want to play one song? Sure. For the peoples? Yeah, I'll play a song. For I'm going to share your social media stuff with everyone. Mm -hmm. um, oh, well, thank you. I'll also, you can check out my music on Spotify. Josh Moncure. Yes. So I'll put those links in the YouTube and oh, the... Thank you spotify podcast thing um and also yeah which song are you gonna play oh i think i'm gonna play a song that uh, a new song that i wrote recently um inspired by the jam session that we had at your place mm -hmm. back on copangan like the open d the open d <laughs> wow when you say it it sounds nice 
<laughs> Remember last night we were talking about how like anything can be made sexual just by the way you say it? I think that's just true for you. For some people, <laughs> you say things and it's immediately not sexual. And I'm like, the op- they're, we're talking about, a, I don't even know what it is. It's a, it's a, a way that you put the guitar. It's just a way of tuning the guitar. <laughs> and I'm like, the open D. Oh. Okay, go get your guitar. Let's do this. Okay. I don't know. I don't remember what time it is, but I know we're supposed to be there at six. Okay. Do, do, do. Wait. Okay. So if you are here still in this intermission, um, I hope you guys all enjoyed that talk with Josh. He's actually a very, very, very. I don't know why I said actually, but you are. Yeah, I had a whole bottle there for you. Um, a very good musician, and I know that he is going to be very famous very soon in this timeline. So um, just know that you're getting a sneak peek into what's coming next. Okay. Can you hear it? I'm going to... Should, Should I hold both? <laughs> <laughs> just hold both of them. This is the coolest studio. The sexiest studio. Oh. <laughs> Say the name of the song one more time. I don't know. Oh, the open D. Are we really calling it this? No, the open not, D. We're not calling it that. But I, like like I can put my legs up like this. Oh. Mm. Thunder. Yeah. Okay. Come on, God knows there's always a price trying to Keep my head above that shallow water line I know you're watching me Watching me all the time Once again I lift my chin Dust off these shoes Give it another go I got nothing to lose I know you're watching me Watching me all the time At times I wonder why we can't be angels Then I recall that you see every angle I know deep down I got nothing to hide Because my God is watching all the time Come on, God, we haven't seen the end And away I'm sinking in that first riverbed I know you're watching me (laughs) Watching me all the time Yes, I may be mortal, but I'm made of higher stuff Why I feel so safe jumping off my bluffs I know you're watching me Watching me all the time You love the sights of me The shadows, baby You help me follow stars Quit running mazes I know deep down I'm already holding the prize Voice crack because, cause my God is watching all the time, all the time, all the time, because my God is watching all the time. Oh my God, I love it so much. Thank you. Thank you for listening, everybody. Thank you, Brittany, for allowing me on your wonderful podcast. I'm happy you came. Yeah. Me too. Should we go smash things? Yes. And not each other. And not each other. <laughs> I was like, so many <laughs> innuendos coming. So much sexual tension. <laughs> okay. We will see you guys on the next episode. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>